computation, and it repeats the, the argument computation n times. And how does it do that? Well, if uh, n is 0, then it doesn't do anything at all. It just returns unit. And if n is uh, bigger than 0, then it performs a followed by a call to repeat. Okay, so this is a for loop written um, uh, without having it built in. So there we are. So that's, that, that's all good. What, what have we achieved by this uh, purely functional um, uh, stuff? We've achieved the ability to mix pure and imperative programs, pure and imperative code, in a single program without them, getting, without them b b polluting each other. And the type system keeps them separate. So uh, all the purely functional rules, in particular beta reduction, maintain unconditionally true. You don't have to say you can do inlining or beta reduction provided it has no side effects. It's still true. That's really good. It also gives you a very fine-grained control of effects. At the moment, I've only talked about pure computations and I.O. computations. But uh, um, I.O. is not the only monad. There are lots of monads. One particularly useful monad is the transactional memory monad that I indicate here. So uh, a, the type system expresses how much, um, how much effects happen. So reverse has type string to string. It has no side effects at all. Uh, the launch the missiles has typed string to I.O. of, what is it, string, list of string, and it has, well, very serious side effects. Um, but transfer, which transfers money from one account to another, transfers uh, N dollars from one account to another, is in this transactional monad that I shan't tell you any more about. You can um, go and read a, a paper about it. And all it does, the transactional monad, STM, has a very limited collection of side effects. You can only read and write transactional variables. You cannot read a character from the terminal or call launch the missiles, but you can, of course, call reverse. So these, the types give you very fine-grained control over how much effects take place, and that turns out to be extremely valuable. Indeed, I think, standing back yet a bit further, that this is perhaps one of the things that Haskell has to contribute to the world. Here's my big picture for what's happening in the, in the, um, the world of programming. On the one hand, there are languages uh, that are useful but dangerous, right? And they have arbitrary effects. So think C up in the top left-hand corner. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, you have lambda calculus, completely safe, right, but useless. Right? Because all you can do is reduce lambda terms and you get, what, another lambda term. You know, you can't, you can't, um, uh, it, it, it can't, hasn't written anything to disk or done database access. So, so what do we want to do? Well, the, um, uh, we want to move towards a place where we have useful languages that, uh, that at least are, are, are somewhat safe. So the, the, the Haskell guys are moving from the no effects world upwards and everybody else is moving from the, um, uh, from the arbitrary effects world towards this uh, nirvana, right? And uh, so I think this plays to what Biana said yesterday about a good language should change the way in which people think about software. I think Haskell has a, or Haskell and, and f f languages like it, purely functional programming languages, do start to change the way in which we think about writing software because they make us think in a different way about effects. So um, there's quite a lot of dynamic going on here. These movements are both taking place. So from the, t from the arbitrary effects end, there's lots of really good, interesting, sophisticated work going on in trying to tame effects in, in language which otherwise arbitrary effects involving regions and ownership types and adding restrictions in one way or another, often through a type system, to, um, to languages that otherwise would support arbitrary effects. And from the other end, um, we are um, busy going to, uh, in Haskell towards selectively um, uh, offering effects. And indeed, the Haskell is not the only language that lives in this corner, right? Where there's very well-known languages like SQL and XQuery and MDX, which, uh, which are all uh, tend to be rather more do domain-specific languages that have very limited sort of effects. Um, so, uh, and th there's lots of cross-fertilization that takes place between these dynamics as well. So. <laughs> In this direction, it is, to be frankly, rather usually envy, right? We wish we could do what they could do. Um, and occasionally, uh, so we, the, I, I, I think that some ideas have gone in the other direction as well. The one that I picked out here is transactional memory. Actually, that was a bi-directional idea. Transactional memory, um, I learnt, first learned about it when um, I went to a talk about Tim Harris's talking about transactional memory in Java. We transliterated it into Haskell and discovered retry in OELS, and we're now busy putting those back into the imperative. So there's a very good and interesting dialogue that takes place across these arrows. So I think this is, this is a good p a picture to bear in mind. So here we are. So this is the, the end of the, what I wanted to say about laziness. Just to say that I think it's um, that relentlessly pursuing a single goal of purity is, is at least something that's worth trying. 
right, and to see where it takes you and may lead us to interesting things. And if we were to think about what the next, uh, what the next Haskell might be like, I'm, I'm actually less, personally, I'm less stressed out about laziness than I was. It's purity that I really want these days. And I think that uh, you know, the, uh, the way I put it is the next ML will be pure and the next, uh, the next Haskell will be lazy, if there is indeed a next on either of these things. And I do think also that imperative languages are likely to embody uh, more and more uh, checkable, um, safe subsets of various kinds. OK, so much about that. Now a um, little bit about type classes, um, which are uh, Haskell's uh, the second major in innovation that I want to speak about. So type classes are um, uh, something that, that, uh, that are unique to Haskell. This really did come with Phil Wadler and, and Stephen Block invented them at exactly the same time that Haskell was being born. So that was an amazing, serendipitous piece of luck. Here, in, in, uh, just in two slides, is the way that type classes work, for those of you who have not seen them before. Um, the idea is that you may define a, um, a class. This is not the same as a class in an object-oriented language. So you should think of this as saying, a type A lies in class eek if it has an equality method whose type is A to A to bool. And then we can, say, we can declare that the type int does indeed sat, lie in the class int by witnessing the fact that there is an equality method, namely the primitive equality on integers. And we can say that the list type, so square brackets in Haskell means list, we say that the li a list of A is indeed an equality type if A is an equality type. So that's the, this says, if A is an equality type, then list A is an equality type. And here is the witness. There is the equality on lists, which uses, in its right-hand side, the equality on elements, as well as recursively using the equality on lists. And then functions, which might want to use equality, uh, a function member which says, is this element a member of this list, will have as part of its type uh, something that says, I, I, the, the type is for all A that lies in the class eek, um, uh, A to list of A to bool. And uh, why does it need to lie in class eek? Because it uses the equality operator. We're down here in this uh, um, equals equals bit. Okay? And uh, so this was introduced initially really as a way to deal systematically with things like equalities and uh, serialization, read and show and numerics. Those are the main motivations for introducing this idea. Now, uh, one of the beautiful things about type classes is the way that they have a very direct um, possible implementation uh, called the dictionary-based implementation. So there, um, the idea is that for every class, so this is just a translation of the previous slide. For every class, I get a, a, a data type. Whoops, here we are, a data type. So here's a data type that is the data type of equality dictionaries. So this is a, a method suite of the operations of the equality type, and there's only one in this case, A to A to bool. Um, then uh, an instance declaration that says eek, uh, int lies in class eek turns into a value of type uh, eek int here. And the value is, well, it's just the equality method for integers. And the witness that, um, do you remember on the previous slide? Here we, we claimed that lists were an equality type. And that turns into a witness that it does. And the witness is a function from a witness that A is an equality type to a witness that equality, e of A, uh, sorry, that list of A is an equality type. And so it goes. Um, and then a function um, uh, like this member, which uh, needed its argument to be an equality type, takes an extra value argument at runtime, which is passed at runtime, which gives it the equality method. So you can think of this as being, I pass to member the equality function. Uh, the way to take equality on the, uh, the elements of the list. So there you are. That's uh, type classes in two slides. Now you know. Well, so Phil and Steve introduced this, and we just adopted it with wild enthusiasm because it was, it was just so beautiful. It was a bit like functional programming itself, but it felt obviously right. And instead of various ad hoc ways of dealing with serialization and numerics, it was a nice, clean, systematic way. So we were very enthusiastic. Then I started to try to implement it. And at that stage, I fell into a pit of despair because it's actually quite difficult to implement type classes well, at least when you do it for the first time. So it took several years of hacking. So hack, 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 hack. And then we built a compiler. And now we think, hey, what's the big deal? All right, so it's, um, it, was a, uh, it was a distinct cycle. I suspect this cycle may be familiar to some of you who've implemented language features as well. <laughs> now, um, type classes, as it turned out, have proved extremely convenient in practice. Um, so it's not just uh, equality in numerics, um, but also monadic operations, time-varying values, pretty printing, collection, reflection, generic programming. It's proved to be much more fertile than we intended. And incidentally, yes, in Haskell, my 17 can definitely be uh, your 23, but even the literals are overloaded. 
So in Haskell, if you say 17 at type uh, T1 and 17 at type T2 are not the same thing at all. Um, so uh, uh, we have dynamic literals, even. Um, so I thought I'd just give you one quick example for what um, uh, for a very beautiful application of type classes uh, called QuickCheck. So uh, 